Amanda. I'm the marketing I'm the marketing coordinator at Warwix. And while we wait for Facebook to send out notifications a few minutes late, I'm just going to say a little bit more about Warwix for those who may not know us. Uh, so we are a bookstore in La Jolla, California, which is north of San Diego proper. We are celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. So our tagline is, Warwix is the oldest continuously family owned and operated bookstore in the United States. Uh, we're not the oldest bookstore flat out, but we're the oldest that has stayed in the same family uh, for the longest time. So the first incarnation of Warwix was opened in 1896 in Minnesota, which is a great state for bookstores, and eventually made its way across the country to land in La Jolla. Uh, Nancy Warwick, our current owner, is the fourth generation owner. So we shut down briefly last year, like many did, uh, but we got up and running again pretty quickly to our normal operations. We do curbside pickup still, and we have a very strong virtual events program, but we're also open for business for those who feel good about coming into the store. And uh, But we're very grateful to be hosting events like this, uh, which may not have necessarily happened in the before times, because we're casting a wider net and gathering all sorts of great new authors to host. So we thank everyone for supporting us through these times. And... With that, I will tell you also, please consider purchasing Red Deception from us, uh, from Warwick's. Uh, we'll put the link in the comments section of Facebook for you. And you'll not only be supporting the authors, you'll be supporting our events program, like for events that you see like this one today. So with that, uh, I will introduce our participants tonight, starting with our interlo interlocutor, uh, Stan Deutsch. He will be in conversation with our authors tonight. So in his more than 50 years in professional media, Stan has logged thousands of hours, both in front of and behind microphones and cameras of several radio and television stations, commercial and non-commercial. For over 23 years, Stan was the Director of Broadcast Operations and National Program Distributor for Northern California Public Media in the San Francisco Bay Area. In addition to stints as morning radio personalities and news reporters, news reporter, he has served as Operations and Sales Manager and Equity Partner at radio stations on both coasts. There have been a few side trips as Marketing Director for a Northern California retail chain college instructor and public school teacher. Uh, Stan also published a weekly New York State-based entertainment magazine and in partnership with his wife, Deborah, operated a successful enter, uh, retail business in Santa Rosa. Now in Sacramento, Stan is retired with more time to enjoy nine grandchildren and one great granddaughter. He's also learning to play pickleball, but still serving his new community as treasurer of his HOA board of directors. So after we play a very cool trailer for the book, um, Stan will introduce Gary and Ed and they will have a great conversation. Remember, you can put your comments and questions into the comments on Facebook and I'll bring those back in after the discussion. So without further ado, Warwick's welcomes Ed Fuller, Gary Grossman and Stan Deutsch. What the hell happened, Riley? Elizabeth, I was on the bridge when the truck exploded. This is right out of the report that I drafted for you. And then the attack in DC? Someone in your office leaked this. It came from inside. The terrorists followed it chapter and verse. I'm sorry, but there's going to be more.
Riley? The question is not who. The question is why. And the answer to that, they want to keep our eyes off the prize. Wow, there you go. Um, that was an amazing trailer. My name is Stan, as Amanda uh, introduced me. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that introduction, just the way I wrote it. I will uh, be your host for today's Zoom and Facebook call, and uh, I want to welcome you as we introduce you uh, to the Red Hotel series of thrillers. Last year's Red Hotel, this year's Red Deception, and uh, next year's Red Chaos. Can't wait for that one. All of those are available, as Amanda mentioned, at warwicks.com. All right, well, let's get into this. Um, I want to introduce you to our two co-authors. Um, first, uh, I guess on your screen left, is uh, Gary Grossman. Full disclosure, co-author Gary Grossman and I have known each other since we both attended Emerson College in Boston, back there as the first graduating class of 1880. Um, <laughs> Long time friends. I have uh, not had the pleasure of meeting Ed Fuller before now, but again, full disclosure, I have stayed at several Marriott hotels over the years, so I consider Ed a brother. Uh, if you have any questions for our co-authors, as Amanda mentioned, please put them in the Facebook chat, and uh, Amanda or I will relay them to Gary and Ed uh, when we get going. Gary's career as an Emmy-winning television uh, producer and journalist for NBC News and ABC and CBS and NBC and Fox and, and PBS, together we've done that, dozens of cable networks, the author of uh, not only these books we're introducing you today, but Executive Action, Executive Treason, and Executive Command, and my favorite, Old Earth. Ed Fuller, former U.S. Army captain. Ed uh, spent a total of 40 years with Marriott International, including 22 as president and managing director of the group's international lodging division. He helped create Marriott's global security strategy and he established the company-wide safety and defense policies amid the growing threat of terrorism worldwide. Also in 2010, Ed wrote a best-selling business book, You Can't Lead With Your Feet on the Desk. And there it is, Gary's holding it up. And you can get that online wherever great books are sold, like Warwick's. All right, gentlemen, welcome to both of you. It's a pleasure to have you here. And welcome to our audience on, on Facebook. Let's, uh, let's get into it. First of all, you guys have such diverse uh, backgrounds, although both of you are authors. Um, how did you both meet? Uh, how, how did this partnership come to be? Gary, take it away. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, perhaps you'll see our dog walking around in the background here. Uh, I was walking him one night uh, in our neighborhood in Los Angeles, Stan, and uh, bumped into a fellow who lived in the neighborhood, uh, Bruce Fierstein. He was walking his dog named Shadow. Interesting name, considering Bruce, what Bruce does. He's a writer and a screenwriter. Among other things, he's written the first three Pierce Brosnan excuse me, Pierce Brosnan, James Bond movies. Uh, and he said, Gary, I have a friend who I'm on a board with at Boston University. His name is Ed Fuller. And he's looking for a collaborator for uh, a novel based on a lot of his experiences. You're a thriller writer. I thought it would be terrific to put you together. I've already talked to Ed about you. And I'd written five novels at that point uh, by myself and had not thought about collaborating, but as a TV producer, and you know as well, Stan, you do collaborate with people and you kind of figure out how you're gonna to work together. I still wasn't sure. I met Ed on, on Bruce's insistence and truly within 30 seconds, I realized he was as much in the anti-terrorism business as the hotel business. Um, he had to get 
and work with his staff and management around the globe, getting people to safety, uh, whether it was in Panama, and he can talk to you about that story, or Tripoli and uh, uh, Cairo, uh, dealing with a bombing in uh, Jakarta. And uh, oh, we're going to get to all that. Yep. And created the awareness, the uh, the uh, color coded system that elevated threat assessments and uh, put the Marriott hotels in a safer place than most other hotels in those same cities. So we met. I reached across the table. I kind of said, you've got to work with some interesting people in the, um, well, maybe a couple of alphabet agencies, FBI, CIA. And I'm still learning who he's worked with and who he's been friends with and who he knows. And suffice it to say, I I'm very nice to Mr. Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have to respect those alphabet agencies. Uh, so basically the credit for these two wonderful books and, uh, and this collaboration uh, goes to uh, your dog, Thames, who needed to uh, take a walk. Yes, and, uh, exactly. And that's how it all, well, congratulations. To Thames. I, hope he gets, uh, I hope he gets a free copy. Uh, so, so how does this collaboration, that's how you guys came together, but how did you decide how to work together? How, how does that work? Well, <clears throat> to start with, I do have a lot of stories and uh, I'm okay at telling stories and that works real well. Great night at the bar. I can get into some really crazy stories that were reality. But <clears throat> at the same time, I am comfortable story writing, but I couldn't glue together the characters. And I'd sit there and sit there. I tried three times. The business book was easy. I knew what I was talking about moment to moment. I knew what the topics had to be. I had whole background studies on each topic because I just took my trip reports from the various challenges that we were dealing with. And the business book was not about the crises as it was how to work with people. So I called Bruce well, actually, I ran into Bruce at one of our meetings, and he says, how's it going? He was trying to encourage me to do this. And I said, Bruce, you know, the first chapter, I'm writing along, and I say, there they are in the cabin up in the north woods with the fire crackling, and they... Uh, well, they made love. Okay, chapter two, I, I went along the same path, except we were down on the Hawaiian Islands, and, and they made love. Chapter three, I said I was tired and needed to change. Not tonight. It was time to go another route. And that other route became Gary. But what I we worked together with is a system that we've developed with a focus on <clears throat> really twists and incidents. And we make up a kind of a fishbone, comes from my production management in uh, business school, but we put together these incidents. We put a lot of concentration on the start we have a clear ending, but I will tell you, we've rewritten both endings uh, and, and we'll probably continue to the rest of our lives. And then we work. Now, I come from the hospitality world. My time in Vietnam was not hospitality. Germany, it wasn't either. But um, what I do is we work on that status and then I go to the executive chef. And the executive chef in this case is Gary. Gary? He, he, he makes it into soup. Take it away. <laughs> yeah, you, you provide the ingredients, Ed, and then Gary makes it into the soup that we, that we want to taste. Oh, much more than a soup. <laughs> much more. Um, well, uh, let's talk about the, uh, because you touched on it and, and, uh, the action in Red Deception is incredible. It's it's nonstop from literally from the first page. 
it takes us from Washington, D.C. to Moscow, to Las Vegas, to London, to New York, Chicago, Brussels, Ukraine. Familiarity with all of those locations is crucial and uh, in order to write about them. So uh, I would assume that is part of the ingredients that Ed provides. And then, Gary, you have to take it and, and say, OK, how do we uh, interpret those events into a storyline that people cannot put down, right? And that absolutely is the approach. Um, Ed and I, through the process, get together constantly. More recently over Zoom, although we're not that far away from one another. Uh, Ed is in uh, Laguna and I'm in, in Los Angeles. Uh, and we would get together for lunches, uh, either down there or up here. Uh, more recently, more Zoom, but we still get together. And uh, Ed, Ed has these amazing stories about his experience and management, uh, and they are death-defying uh, and life-saving uh, in many, many ways. But there are also ways there, the, his, his book, not surprisingly, You Can't Lead With Your Feet on the Desk, really suggests what's in Red Deception and Red Hotel, because it's about somebody who was in the field, not just you know, from up high uh, in the office at the top of the tallest building in New York or Chicago or wherever, uh, it's actually being down on the ground and uh, working with people and working through problems. The problems that we have that are in, in red deception begin, as you said, with infrastructure, attacks on America's infrastructure in Washington. Uh, with a bridge being bombed. And then in um, New York with the Lincoln Tunnel and the Stan Musial Bridge and the threats that can be created that create anxiety all across the country, ultimately with a, with a suggestion that there are two targets. One is Hoover Dam and another is the White House itself and the, the presidency. Um, a lot of those are not things that Ed has been involved in and I've been involved in, but the strategies are really part of Ed's experience and how people uh, in the heat of the moment deal with things as we're seeing certainly every day on the news and the past couple of weeks, what's been happening in Afghanistan with uh, uh, getting people out of harm's way. Ed's done that starting in his military career, let alone. And I, I want to talk about that. that. That's that's the timing of not only this discussion, but of the uh, of this book being out. You I mean, you, you couldn't, uh, from a purely public relations point of view and sales point of view, you couldn't ask for uh, a better time. First of all, we're discussing infrastructure in Congress and uh, bridges and tunnels and railroads and, and airports and all of the things that are in this story that are in danger, uh, terrorism uh, causing uh, danger. Um, the scene in Red Deception, there, there's two scenes that come to mind right now, which of course, we had a tragic suicide bombing last weekend. There is a truck suicide bomb in uh, Washington DC on the bridge that you just mentioned. And in the Ukraine, we have a, a, an amazing evacuation of hotel guests um, using buses, uh, which is just uh, mind blowing. And uh, Ed, you've experienced these. Um, I mean, how how much of your direct experience is in what Gary and you have written here about those events? Well, I'll start with the first edition because a lot of people are going back and buying the Red Hotel before they dig into the Red Deception. And the very first scene in the Red Hotel was the clear attack and explosion and bombing of the Tokyo Hotel. Right. That in reality was the first bombing of the Indonesian JW Marriott. And other than the fact it took me a day and a half to get there, I had people on the ground as well as owners and managers who were involved in the explosion. The GM's wife had just gone back up to her room because she forgot something. And so she was saved because the cab she was getting into was destroyed at the front entrance. So 
when you get into that story, there is so much of reality. And then of course, Gary just smooths those rough edges and makes it work. So you, you raise the issue of the Ukraine and the evacuation. Yeah. That was Libya. We had just opened a hotel in Libya, so we had an inordinate number of staff and we had guests who were not Libyan. And so that escaped from that, I wish we had an hour, from that particular hotel involved a number of skills. We had plans to escape by over the um, Tunisian border. That was turned down when we heard that another uh, caravan going there had been attacked people hurt, taken advantage of, and we canceled that idea. Next one was to go by boat. So we got $300,000 to Malta to, to lease the boat. And guess who was there before us? The United States. And that boat did not leave before we got out a different way. We got our money back. And so the next thing was we were sitting there scratching our head. What do we do next? And one of our teams said, you know, there's a company in Jordan that provides armed security around the plains and works in Africa for United Nations projects. So we called them. They wanted, amazingly enough, $300,000. We had to get that from Doha and bring that money in to their offices in Jordan. And the plane was then released to come to Libya, to the airport. And there we were trying to get our people out. There's a long story of how we dressed everybody in the same color. We got them to the bus ready to go. And the driver forgot his keys <laughs> and that is that is in the book <laughs> it's it's an amazing the fact that that actually happened Ed, is mind-blowing that that you know you, you you almost when you read it you go oh nobody could be that really that happened. um that's that's amazing so so these are all based on you know what comes across to me is as somebody who occasionally stays in hotels and um there's so much more to the hospitality business than making sure housekeeping brings you that extra tall, isn't there? Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that keeps those of us who are in our nice, cozy little room safe. And obviously, if you choose to be in a place like Olivia or, uh, or some other place like that, which is in imminent uh, danger of, of possibly terrorists, um, there's somebody like Ed uh, looking out for you. And, and speaking of somebody like Ed, the hero of the Red Hotel series is our, our man, Dan Riley. Dan is the president of International uh, Kensington Royal Hotel Corporation. That's the fictional corporation that Gary has come up with. And it's based on you, Ed. So I guess my question is, do you see yourself as a heroic person? Uh not when I was dealing with the problems, I was charged with the responsibility and I took that very seriously. I did not have a lot of ladies running around uh, trying to entice me. We were trying to solve problems. And when we went into Cairo uh, during Mubarak's departure, I was actually on the ground there and in uh, some of the other cases, such as Thailand and Indonesia, I was on the ground when the incidents occurred. <clears throat> it was not brought together in that perfect stew that Gary put together and couldn't have been done with me alone. I can tell you about each story. I can tell you about Panama and evacuations. I can do about six evacuations that oh, but, I was involved in. But wait, read the book. That's where you get the story from. And, um, and, and so, okay, you kind of said, well, there's no, you know, ladies hanging around, but we do have a love interest. 
Miss uh, Marnie Babbitt, who uh, is in this book. And uh, let's just say, uh, to, uh, to be nice about it, uh, Gary has created Marnie uh, for Dan Riley. And she is Dan Riley's love interest and so much more. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask Ed if he had any firsthand uh, uh, experience with uh, a Marnie. But Gary, either one of you can handle that. Well, I can get it started by saying my wife has had impact on all names, especially my ex-wife, Pam. And, <laughs> and uh, obviously, Marnie was approved by the higher authority in the house. And uh, Gary knows Michaela very, very well. But you don't mess with an Italian. And I learned that very <laughs> early in the game. So the answer is no. And um, there are things that would not have clicked for me that clicked for Dan. So Gary is not trying to make me into Dan. He's using Dan to be an example of what I did some of. And of course, then we have Gary's mind at work. So mm -hmm. you need to ask the same question of Gary. And I will. Helen. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to I wanted to cloak the question for Gary a, a little differently, and then you can get into that. With, with Marnie and with uh, uh, Dan Riley as an absolute heroic figure in both of these books. Um, your books, both these two books and Executive Action series and the Red Hotel series, uh, play out in the reader's mind as you read them as if you're watching a movie. I mean, they are so visually real. So I wanted to ask you as a writer, is there a special technique for that? Do you, do you think in terms of, because you are a writer, you're putting words down on the page, but uh, you're also a television producer. Um, and so as, as, as you read these, as I said, it is all right there in front of you. I can picture Marnie, I can picture uh, you know, Riley uh, and all of the characters. How do you do that? Um, it's kind of like a Twilight Zone episode. Sometimes, as Ed said, we have a, a, a we, we begin with an outline. We know where we're going. We know what's happening. And then the weirdest thing, there'll be this kind of knock on the door. There's no door here, but there's a knock on the door. And a character will come in and say, Gary, move over. So I will go like this. And uh, then the character will start dictating. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I know what you had planned, but here's where we're gonna go. And the characters develop their own voice and, and take over. And I, I teach at Loyola Marymount University and was telling my students just that last night. Um, it's the weirdest, wildest thing. So that they reveal themselves. And in some cases with Marnie, Marnie is introduced in Red Hotel, the first book in the series. Um, we find her in the second book, and we didn't really know uh, all that there was to know about Marnie until right. the second book. Um, and that's where she really reveals herself, and no spoiler alert, that she's, she's an, an interesting character who's pivotal to the story and the plot. Uh, but uh, we learn a lot more about her because Ed and I learned more about her. Um, so that in terms of characters, it, I think answers part of the question. The other is, uh, I love, as Ed does, uh, the thriller novels and action movies and the Bourne movies and the James Bond movies. Uh, and, I, and I, as a TV producer, I'm thinking visually. Uh, I also, uh, considering my dad was in law enforcement, my mom in politics, um, I really know that when things are successful, it's because smart people like Ed tell other smart people what's going on or hear what's going on. Mm. And that's how problems get solved. And when smart people don't tell one another things or dumb people don't pass things along, uh, that's when uh, incidences, um, for example, you, you're, uh, you're running an airline school and, and a couple of people come in and say, hey, we want to learn how to fly a 747, a jumbo jet. You know, yeah. sign right here. Uh, we also uh, can teach you how to land and take off. No, we're not interested in that. Just how to fly it. Wouldn't right. you think that's what you pass on to other people as a red flag? 
Um, maybe that's a title for book four, Red Flag. I was I just thinking, <laughs> was book four. <laughs> it, it, just, it just hit me. Um, so um, cinematically, um, that's how I uh, like to write and knowing that you can have a lot of things happening at the same time, uh, sometimes shorter chapters. I know today, even uh, Red Chaos, uh, it, it, it's coming along, it'll be out next year, is written faster than many of the books that I did years ago. And in terms of action, uh, I've got Ed's uh, notes right here for rewrites on um, Red Chaos. And what is the main thing we talk about is action. You know, once, once you know who the characters are, you can really then think about how would they react in this situation. And for a lot of that, I said, okay, Ed, how did you react? in that situation. So this yeah. goes back to Marnie. If we wanna finish up with Stan on this lovely young lady. Um, I spent time in East Germany when it was still East Germany. Had to go in and out of Checkpoint Charlie. And we stayed in a beautiful hotel that the Swedes had built. And <clears throat> you could only stay in the hotel if you were not East German, because this hotel made hard currency. And so we went into the bar. I was not married at this time. I've got to get that disclaimer up. And uh, we're sitting at the bar and you could not believe how very attractive these young ladies were. And I'll stop there on how attractive. They were very good looking. And of course, I'm beginning to look around. And one of the French delegates that are with us, and I will always thank him for this, said, Ed, no. He says they're all working for Stasi. And in reality, your bedroom probably has the camera in it. And that can happen. I've got another 10 stories that go down that alley. But that's what Marnie has got in interest to people uh, because even at the end of the last book, and this is no exaggeration, I had 20, 25 people say to me, we're in love with Marnie, what's gonna happen? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, we're not gonna, we're not gonna uh, reveal uh, what happens with to for Marnie or any of that stuff because you've got to read the book but uh, you do and, and I, I think we pretty quickly here at some point want to take some questions from our viewers out there in Facebook world but you mentioned um, that we do have uh, cameras uh, in in so many hotels around the country around the world rather specifically some of the uh, uh, lesser friendly uh, Eastern Bloc countries and, and China and, and Russia. Uh, and so do you just assume, if you have a hotel in, in those countries, do you assume that they have well, been We wired? have a hotel, but we know what the status of the cameras are. I would tell you OPEC meets in Austria, in Austria on a regular basis. And we had just renovated the hotel, uh, and we had a customer that came in, bought all the suites, and a little later, about six years later, we were redoing the walls, and when they took down the paper, there were the listening devices and all the suites, Wow! and so the GM called and said, what are we doing? I said, well, find out anybody who has stayed in those suites as a group. Well, it happened to be the US Embassy. Of and of course, when the OPEC conference came up, so the GM there is good friends with an ambassador. He put them in a big paper bag, two or three of them, and walked down to the embassy and dropped them on the desk. It says, if you have anything you wanna tell me, give me a call. But there you go. So you can see there are so many stories from Ed that Ed and Gary are going to be working on for not only the next book, but probably the next book after that one. Um, I think uh, we're being joined by uh, Amanda from Warwick's Books. And Amanda, you have some 
some comments and questions from our viewers? I do. There, there's just a lot of love, uh, first off. Um, June says, hi, Gary. And uh, Dwayne said, Gary, you write books? Did I know this? <laughs> <laughs> Congrats again, my friend. As someone who understands the process, this only strengthens my respect for you. Um, there is a series of questions from Turner, uh, and you sort of address some of this, but I still want to relay his questions. So Gary, can you describe the writing process? Aside from Zoom conversations, Gary, did you interview, record? put together a draft after every chapter for Ed? How did you organize Ed's stories? Yellow pad, post-its? As uh, executive chef, how much did Ed let you create? And Ed, how much does trust play into allowing Gary to do what he does best? Thank you. Great questions. Ed, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll do the last one first. The trust level is incredible. But guess what? Gary held up the notes from my last review of our third book, and I had some opinions and questions. And so we will go back and forth at least through two rounds. And during the preparation, of course, I have input on the various stories, especially the ones that involve me. The other thing is I have a lot of input on the strategy. And I don't want to go into red chaos at this point, but we had one incident in the book that you're about to read in which we totally had a hole. We thought we're looking for some turnaround. And I was able to contribute and say, we ought to take this this way. Yeah, it came out of one of my stories. I crashed in a plane in Columbia we just moved the plane to another country and we were off and running. Gary? Well, and that is the section in Red Deception on Venezuela, which um, has parallels to the Cuban Missile Crisis, but based on an experience that Ed had getting from one place to another and dealing with some really bad people with uh, uh, guns that fire multiple bullets in, in an instant. Um, by the way, uh, Turner, I believe, is writing in from Costa Rica, if it's the same Turner. And, uh, and June uh, was my very first fan when I was a disc jockey, if it's the same June, and I think it is, uh, back in Hudson, New York, on radio station WHUC. Wow. Uh, and uh, so I thank both of you for uh, joining us today. And um, the question was in terms of uh, uh, writing process, um, it is um, a collaboration, but um, I think the hardest part for Ed is uh, even though we're meeting all through the writing period, I'm off writing and he really chomps at the bit justifiably and wants to read what I have. And I say, no, 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 not yet. No, 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 not yet. No, no, no. And I do that as long as I can possibly can. And here comes the dog that put us together. Um, and uh, it's a family show right here. Okay. And uh, then Ed gets it. And from that, uh, he gives me notes. If we talk about what needs to go in, uh, what uh, uh, more action? Uh, we try to keep a word count down so that you know we're not writing the next James Michener novel going on for 800 pages. And so it gets longer, then it gets shorter, and it gets better, and it gets better. And it's a great collaborative process. And how could it not be when I get to work with and listen to the stories of the most interesting person you could ever imagine meeting? Yeah. And I would only add one thing. The main thing is we've never gone to battle. Nope. We've always come to consensus. And if the U.S. Congress could do the same, <laughs> we'd all be very happy. Yeah, amen to that. Um, yeah. Any other questions that are, that are uh, coming up? 
Well, just wanted to mention, June says, yes, it's me, your weather girl. Thank you. Very good. What a surprise. What a hoot. Thank you. <laughs> and Turner said, yes, it's me. Um, it's great. I have a quick question. Yes. Readers usually want to know when it comes to a series, um, is it necessary to read the first book before moving into Red Deception? Really helpful. Because I would yeah, the I would first say so. book spent a lot of time with character background and establishing key characters that continue through the book from there on out. But it's not necessary, but you'd be amazed that we're selling more of the Red Hotel than we ever thought because people are doing that. Gary, do you agree? Or? Yeah, I agree. Um, same thing for my other series, the executive series. When you have four books, uh, people can pick it up uh, at any point. Um, they, those are individual stories, but the first book is always the origin story of how the main characters get together. And, and I would say, uh, just Gary, you, just as a, as a compliment, you do a great job, even though, yes, I would recommend uh, that Red Hotel be read, uh, be read, R-E-A-D, um, <laughs> prior to, to picking up Red Deception, I think it will help. But Gary does a really terrific job of establishing the characters, even in the second book, or, and recapping some of the events that do, that do bring you back. So it isn't, you're not going to be lost, no. but it would, it would be helpful uh, because you get the whole feel for what's happening and who Dan Riley is, who Marnie is, and, and what her background is and why what happens in the second book is kind of incredible. Uh, so I would recommend it, but it's not absolutely necessary. And the common denominator for both books, and it does extend into our next book too, is a, uh, a really bad guy named Ni uh, Nikolai Gorshkov. Oh yeah. He's a, a stand-in for Vladimir Putin and has very much of the same background that Putin has. He came out of the Cold War uh, believing that uh, Russia's, the Soviet Union's greatest mistake or Russia, the Kremlin's greatest mistake was uh, uh, destroying the Soviet empire and uh, bringing down the wall and uh, letting go of the satellite nations that are on Russia's Western border, uh, a, uh, a barrier between the East and the West and allowing them, many of them to be able to join NATO uh, and essentially form a greater bloc against Russia. This particular president, Nikolai Gorshkov, wants to rebuild that empire again. And uh, the Ukraine is part of that, as Ukraine actually is in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Baltic states, uh, Latvia, Estonia, and uh, Lithuania are. And uh, in truth, if he could have the top of it and the bottom, then maybe the other nations could fall into line. And how does he do it? He does it through deception and maybe a little chaos in the next book is something he's interested in doing. And in Red Hotel, it's the beginning of um, his plots. And Ed, Ed always describes him as the puppet master. And he is the puppet master behind uh, all that goes on pretty much like the real guy is too. And we talked about uh, uh, China and Russia and, and some of the places Ed has been, but uh, North Korea plays an interesting role in this story as well. And you wouldn't think they would, but they do. And again, you have to read the stories to understand how, but um, it's again, you know, ripped out of, of today of the world we live in. North Korea is uh, uh, an interesting player in all of this. No question about it. And while I've stood on the North Korean border, I have not had the opportunity to go there. We just couldn't get the hotel built. So uh, the fact is that uh, I think you find different countries. I use Panama. If I can digress to a short story, Panama has had huge number of people retire there before Noriega took power. I'm talking about Americans that were citizens of Panama. Mm -hmm. And when things started really getting rough by 
uh, Mr. Noriega's approach to fairness and control of the canal, guess what? The American troops went in and we had a hotel there. And this was really at the first end of my job uh, for Marriott running the international. And it was really a worrisome thing. What were we gonna do with the people we had in the hotel? And clearly Noriega told, sent out his troops and said, go to the hotels and get all the Americans you can out of those hotels and get them out now. And so sure enough, our GM is in the United States having heart surgery. And so we had a pure Pan Panamanian staff. And the question you have to ask, are they gonna be more for Noriega or for our guests? Well, Noriega's troops arrived. I visited right after this and I can tell you every door in the hotel had been machine gunned, not to find and take anybody live back, but to drag them out and throw them in the back of their truck. I went down with the resident manager and I said, so what did you do? And he said, well, we had 67 people and we took them down, we put them in the laundry and they were in dryers and washers and we put dirty laundry in up so that you wouldn't look through it. And when they came here, they looked around, looked under a couple of tables and walked out. And so that's where we kept them until the escape to take place. Wow. Wow. Now, Panama, I've been back to, we put in a lot of hotels. It's a, the country changes. And going back to Stan's point, um, one day that country is a friend, the next day it's a foe. And uh, in the days of the Cold War, you kind of knew where the border was. Mm. And today, that's not the case. Right, right, wow. Boy, those stories are, are just hair raising and uh, somebody should write a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have one more great question uh, from Deborah. Ed, what's the most frightening situation you've been in? Been in the Vietnam War because it was personally frightening to me. But when you're talking about these incidents, um, any number of challenges are frightening because I feel a responsibility for the people. And when I have some of the staff kidnapped in Mexico, kidnapped in uh, Lebanon, uh, and we're trying to get them out, I'm concerned to the point of being frightened if I'm not going to be successful in doing it. It's the one thing that in my job, which I loved, and I was aware of that I had the accountability and the responsibility. And if I had that, and that's the way Bill Marriott set us up, then I had better deliver. So yeah, those were frightening to me, even if I was on the ground in Egypt, which I was for all 10 days, but it's all about being able to fulfill the mission. Yeah, I would think in those situations, Ed, if you're not somewhat frightened and uh, the adrenaline isn't, isn't running through you to give you the action that you need, there's something wrong. Uh, you can't, those are not everyday incidents that uh, you can just, uh, you know, not pay attention. That's amazing. So great stories. Um, and uh, I, I highly recommend uh, um, that everybody watching, listening, um, run right out to Warwick's Books <laughs> or when you get done here and uh, buy. If you haven't read uh, uh, Red Hotel, definitely read, read that and then Red Deception. Buy them both and get prepared to buy uh, Red Chaos next year because um, they're really books that you will not put down and you will not easily forget. They will, if you've ever stayed in a hotel, and we all have, 
you will look at that experience with a little different light. Stan, can I uh, turn to Ed to share one of his, or a couple of his tips for Absolutely. being a hotel? And, uh, you know, you're offered the 25th floor with a great view. Ed, do you take those when you're traveling? I only go there when I have to. Uh, generally, I would stay in any hotel on the seventh floor down. Now, if you're in New York, you can go a few few stories further up, but if you're not in a large city, you really want to stay no higher than seven. I'm looking at some puzzled faces, except for Gary, and that is the height of the ladder companies that service those towns. And uh, if you're in a four-story hotel, you still want, may want to stay lower because that town might not have the latter company that makes seven, but they mostly can do seven and above and seven is a safe level. Huh. I did have one other point though, Gary, that I think is important. And then I'll try to throw in a couple of pieces of advice and Gary can wrap it up. Both books now have audio and we just released the audio and a lot of people love to listen to the audio in the car. And I won't name people specifically because obviously Gary's folks are chasing him all over the world. But um, <laughs> at this point in time, it is also a phenomenally well done package by uh, a wonderful, wonderful individual. And we think we've got a great audio that depicts what the story really says. Uh, but other, uh, other real things that you need to look at, when you go in that hotel room, how many people read the instructions on the back of the door? I would say one in 10. Well, those instructions have great value because you need to know where that exit is. And you need to know exactly where it is. Um, I've been in a hotel fire where you crawl down the hall. You're looking for people that haven't gotten out of their room and haven't known what to do. Usually scared sitting in the room and you go, okay, follow me. And we, we go down the hall. But the fact is the information is there. The instructions are there. And that kind of guidance is priceless, uh, as is making sure when you go in the hotel, you understand the first floor. And it is not going to be easy to go out the front door. You're going to be coming down back doors. And you want to understand where you might want to go when you do get down there. Now, I'm not going to speak about wardrobe, uh, but I've gone through some of these uh, fire um, situations where the, actually, uh, the, we never had the fire, but we had the alarm. And you should see some of the outfits that come down those stairs. <laughs> but there's the need for it. And the one thing we took pride in for Marriott, and this is an ad for Marriott, so Stan will get some more points. <laughs> and that was the fact that when you were in a Marriott, it was the safest hotel in town. Bill Marriott insisted on regulations that exceeded local fire code. And we never lost, during my 40 years, we never lost someone in a fire. We had a fire, but our systems were such that it controlled it, contained it, and then we had to get people out. So with that kind of direction from the top, you were really proud to work for that company. That's, that's, that's wonderful to hear. And uh, something that a lot of us who stay in hotels are just not aware of. And uh, great advice, Ed, thank you so much. You, you may have in fact saved a couple of lives here today. Stan, I, your emphasis saved the lives. I just told the story. <laughs> I wow, in in 
in these uncertain times, I feel like I would love to uh, subscribe to your your daily tips for survival. Um, <laughs> something we like to ask all of our event participants at the end of our events is, are you on social media? Where can we find you? Uh, it seems like you would be a great person to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, it's been eight years since I left Marriott, but I have traveled China, Middle East, and Europe pretty regularly since because I was working in the travel industry. So those were still reasonably uh, active. Now I've got to see how we come out of COVID to be able to give you a good day to day. So right now, history is better than current. Okay. Not, you're not much case. for a social media presence. Oh, Gary, you, you could list the... Uh, uh, we have uh, redhotel.com, which uh -huh. is the main website. Uh, our three www.redhotel.com or just redhotel.com. You can see the book trailer for Red Hotel uh, as Red Hotel book trailer. And likewise, anyone who joined late the book trailer for Red Deception is Red Deception book trailer, and you'll find that. Ed is um, on, uh, uh, is it on Instagram? Your author, Ed Fuller, uh, or it may be on Twitter. Um, same, I'm, same. Yep, and uh, both. And, and I'm Gary Grossman1 on Twitter and on uh, Instagram. Um, and uh, we love to hear from people. Um, and we occasionally share some of the, the, the tips that Ed has as well. Uh, the one that always stays with me is if you see something, say hey, something. Yeah. And now more than ever, uh, you just have to do it. If you see a suitcase on the street as I have and nobody's around, you know, call and say, I don't know what that is, but I think somebody needs to check it out or a package left in uh, an airport. You have to do it. We all have to be vigilant. And uh, Stan, thank you for all the uh, uh, compliments on the book, uh, the books, and likewise- Well deserved, Stan, well deserved. For having us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to uh, host this. You were great. Thank you both. Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for making, uh, putting this together and for, I guess, uh, sort of uh, coming in at the last moment to uh, help out here. Uh, um, it's, uh, it was great. And uh, I hope that uh, everybody watching uh, is as impressed, will be as impressed if they read these books as, as I have been with these two amazing folks who uh, collaborate on these books. And of course, Thames. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say it was hard to pay strict attention to everything y'all were saying because there was a dog lovingly gazing up at his person falling asleep. And, and it was beautiful. <laughs> anyway. He's the dog so who much. brought us together. <laughs> oh, really? Yep, yep. Sure. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. He carries a lot of responsibility. Oh. <laughs> um. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today and we're going to take us all off Facebook. So remember, we have the books at, War we, at Warwick's available. And thank you so much for joining us. You can watch this event again on Facebook, and we'll also have it on our YouTube channel to watch again. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank Bye, you everybody. Thanks, our friends, Bye. for calling in. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stan.